Hey everyone, uh, Zach here from the history team of Three Rivers Park District. Um, and now, I don't know about you guys, but when I open up my social media feed, I'm seeing a whole lot of talk about toilet paper. People are talking about their diminishing supplies of toilet paper. They're wondering which stores have it in stock, how can they get more? And they're even wondering, what are some of the alternatives that they could use if say they couldn't get access to toilet paper? And we've even gotten some of these questions online where people are asking the history team, well, you know, what did people do in the past? Uh, how, what did that look like? Did they have toilet paper? What did they wipe with? And so I want to do a little video to kind of answer some of those questions because I think they're good questions. You know, this is something that it's a it's a universal concept. It's something that we all have in common because everybody poops. Uh, now, even though everybody poops, different cultures have developed kind of different cultural norms around it. Like, you know, how do you do it? What kind of infrastructure does it require? Uh, how do you clean up? How acceptable is it to talk about it? You know, so when people ask, well, how did people do it in the past? Well, there's millions of different answers depending on time and place. You know, for example, um, ancient Romans used to use uh, public uh, bathhouses and you would use a, a shared sponge that you would share with the person who came before or after you. Some people probably think that's pretty gross and it did have some health consequences. Uh, I've read that ancient Greeks used um, flat stones that they, that they would use their own stone. Um, in ancient China, they were an early adopter of writing with paper. They've been writing with paper for uh, centuries when other people were using, uh, you know, vellum or papyrus. So they've had scraps of paper and they've been using that as toilet paper for a long time. So there's different answers throughout time and place. Uh, the answer I want to focus on today is what does it look like to go to the bathroom uh, in the 19th century in the Minnesota River Valley. And to help me tell that story, I'm here today at the Landing Minnesota River Heritage Park in Shakopee, Minnesota. It's a three rivers park along the Minnesota River. It's 88 acres of hiking trails, but it also has 34 historic buildings that are either in their original location or have been preserved and moved here to help us tell the story of the Minnesota River Valley. So it's all kinds of historic homes like this one that's behind me here. Now, I'm in the recreated village of Eagle Creek, where it's always the year 1889. And in 1889, there are some rudimentary forms of indoor plumbing, but they don't really work that well. And they're certainly not common in rural towns like this. So the house that's behind me here uh, wouldn't have an indoor toilet that you could flush and then it would go to pipes underneath the ground, into a sewer and out into the river, and certainly not into some kind of a wastewater treatment facility like that. Um, instead of an indoor toilet with indoor plumbing, people like this that lived in this house would use an outhouse. Um, and let's go look at an example of an outhouse so we get an idea of what we're talking about. This is a pretty good example of what an outhouse looks like in the 19th century in the Minnesota River Valley. Uh, an outhouse is a, a small, simple shed, usually just one room. And inside there would be a bench seat with a hole in the seat. And underneath that hole is a pit in the ground, a big hole. So you can sit on the bench, do your business. It drops down into the hole. Um, over time, if somehow you win enough that it filled up the hole, you could just simply bury the hole, move the outhouse and start at a new location. Um, now, full disclosure that uh, buildings that look like outhouses at the landing, usually as a general rule, aren't actually historic buildings. So for example, this one was built, I think just last year or two years ago as an Eagle Scout project. And as another general rule, the buildings that look like outhouses at the landing are not actually functional outhouses. So don't use them. For example, this one, if I open it up, you'll see it's actually just a wood shed. It stores all the wood that uh, fuels the stove inside the house nearby. Uh, for a variety of reasons, we don't want to use actual functional outhouses. And so please don't use the outhouses. They're not real outhouses, but this is a good example of what an outhouse would look like. Now there is an exception to that rule though. There is a, a historic outhouse here at the landing and it's really, I think it's one of the most underrated buildings we have at the landing. Um, I want to go take a look. I'm going to show you this historic uh, outhouse at the landing. So here it is, uh, in my opinion, one of the most underrated historic buildings we have at the landing, a true underdog. This is the historic outhouse or also called a privy. Uh, so you can see it's a pretty nice privy or an outhouse compared to the last one we looked at. Uh, it's a nice sturdy building made out of bricks. You can see it's pretty large, it's got a window in it. It's actually large enough that um, there's actually two seats in it, so it can fit two people at the same time. So, you know, maybe you don't want to wait while it's occupied or I don't know, maybe you've got like a good conversation you don't want to interrupt. So it's actually a two-seater. And if you look at the front, you can actually see there's two crosses right by the entrance. 
Um, and that's because this historic building comes from the uh, Marystown Catholic Monastery uh, outside of Shakopee. So it was actually built in 1880, so it's actual historic privy, and it was moved to the park in 1974. Um, but it's in a kind of out of the way spot. It's far on the eastern end of the park near the park office. So a lot of people um, don't get this far or you walk right by it, but it's a, it's a kind of cool little building. Um, there's nothing inside it right now. It, it's uh, not really a place that we interpret too much, but it has, um, But you can see, um, even though it's a pretty nice outhouse and it's spacious and it's and it's sturdy and there's a lot of room, um, it still involves getting outside your home, going outside and going to the outhouse to go to the bathroom, which on a day like today isn't so bad, but you can imagine on a cold winter Minnesota morning, um, that's probably not ideal to have to put on your boots and trudge through the snow, it might be freezing, just to go to the bathroom. And so most people, even if they had an outhouse, had a chamber pot that they could use inside their home as well. Let's go check out a chamber pot. I think we'll look at the one in the banker's house. Okay, so I'm here in the master bedroom of the banker's house. Now again, um, homes like this don't have indoor plumbing. So to use the bathroom, you'd have to get up and go outside even on a cold winter morning. And that doesn't sound ideal. And so most people at the time also keep something called a chamber pot. So there's one down right over here. And so the chamber pot is just a pot with a lid that you can use to go in the bathroom if you wake up in the night or don't wanna go outside, you, you go in there and put the lid back on and then in the morning you have to pick it up, carry it outside and empty it outside somewhere. Maybe you pour it in your outhouse or maybe you just pour it you know, off in the woods somewhere or something. Um, and so that's a chamber pot. So it's kept here, normally it's tucked underneath the bed or it might be kept in a small like nightstand uh, type of piece of furniture called a commode. That's why it's still oftentimes, you know, a bathroom is sometimes called a commode. It was a piece of furniture that held your chamber pot. Um, so still probably not ideal, but it's maybe better than going outside on a cold winter day. And I know you're all thinking, okay, you told us about outhouses, you're telling us about chamber pots, you still haven't answered the question about toilet paper. Did they have toilet paper? Don't worry, we're going to get to that next. I think we're going to run over to the general store and we'll see if they've got any toilet paper over there and we'll cover it. I'm here in the general store of Eagle Creek. It sells just a little bit of everything you need, general merchandise. And I'll finally answer the question. The question is, do they have commercially available toilet paper in 1889? And the answer is yes, kind of. Okay, so there is commercially available toilet paper. In 1857, uh, a man named Joseph Gaiety, he's, he's uh, credited with um, inventing the commercially available toilet paper. It does not look like the toilet paper we have today with like a, a nice big cottony roll. It literally comes as a pack of just sheets, like like you would buy like almost like printer paper, but smaller, and it's, and it's hard. It's just sheets of paper that you would use for wiping your butt. Now, um, even though it was available, um, it wasn't really that commonly used because it was kind of expensive to buy this commercially available toilet paper and its only use was for wiping after you go to the bathroom. It was kind of expensive when there were other alternatives that people could use. Now, what are those alternatives? Well, a lot of people living in a rural town like this that are, you know, it's a farming community, they're gonna use a lot of corn cobs. So corn cobs, after you shuck the corn off of them and stuff, you can have a whole basket full of them in your outhouse and you can use those, they're free. You just get them on your farm and you can use those. And then after you're done with it, you just throw it right down in the outhouse uh, pit, just like everything else. Uh, so a lot of people are using corn cobs, otherwise using scraps of paper that were meant for something else. So it might be, you know, maybe an old letter or in 1889, Magazines and catalogs are super common. Every year there's a new catalog, whether it's Montgomery Ward or Sears. Um, there's all kinds of special trade catalogs or farmers are buying catalogs for their seeds. There's magazines like Harper's. So after you read these, you know, maybe you bring it in for reading material in the outhouse and after you're done reading, um, you tear out a page, use that, throw it down with everything else and you're on your way. So a lot of people are using free alternatives and not really using the commercially available toilet paper. That's more intended for high-end use, like really nice hotels would have special toilet paper that's just for toilet paper. They're not gonna reuse magazines and hotels. And over time, people start wanting that kind of higher-end luxury that you would get at a hotel, and then it becomes more common to buy commercially available toilet paper. The other thing going on is, you know, Victorians um, are kind of known for their Victorian sensibilities and not really getting into taboo subjects too much in public. 
Um, and so maybe it's kind of embarrassing for people to come into a general store and ask the storekeep for paper to wipe their butt. Maybe they don't really want to talk about that. So they're going to find some of those other free alternative things. But over time, it becomes more acceptable. It becomes more of this luxurious fashion to have that. And at the same time, um, there's this move in kind of the end of the century, going into the 20th century for sanitation, where uh, bathrooms, you know, they get indoor plumbing and they start to get more... Um, like sanitized, almost hospital-like and clean and white surfaces. And that's where they kind of have that move towards toilet paper. And at the same time that indoor plumbing is happening, you kind of have to have toilet paper because when indoor plumbing is around, you can't just flush corn cobs down the toilet anymore. You need special toilet paper that's gonna work well with your plumbing so it can go out the pipes, out into the sewers and, and out to where, where it's going, probably the river. Um, so those are the kind of things happening. So is toilet paper available? Yes, you can go to some stores and you can buy toilet paper. Was it a common thing to do in 1889? Not yet. You'd have to wait a couple years for it to be a really common thing. So, um, you know, about 1900 uh, is where the rolls of toilet paper, uh, especially the ones made by Scott, which they're still making toilet paper, the Scott Paper Company, um, they kind of perfect the rolls of toilet paper and then it really takes off from there. So in 1889, you're not quite seeing the, the same use of toilet paper. Um, I think that's it for today. Um, thank you for joining me on a little uh, Throwback Thursday look at bathroom history. It's kind of been a fun little topic. Um, if you have any other questions about uh, bathroom history, toilet paper, or anything else, feel free to post in the comments and we'll get back to you. Thanks guys. Bye.